On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples telling them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you, follow him, Say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. It is one of the twelve, he replied one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. When he took a cup... And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Amen. Uh, our second reading is from Acts chapter 2. Uh, verses 37 to 41. Uh, and you can find that on page 1694 of the Pew Bibles. This is God's word. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and set to Peter and the other apostles... Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Amen. Thank you, Sharif. Can you help me with that? <laughs> You're a member of the church now. You need to work hard. Uh, last week, we spoke about what it is to be a member of the church and, and why that's important and the reasons that we gather together. Today, I want to speak about why do we do these things, and by these things, I mean these things, baptism and the Lord's Supper or communion or the Eucharist. You might know it by different names. I want to be clear that I'm going to be focusing on why we do these things not on how we do these things. Across the Christian churches, most Christian churches will agree on the why we do these things. But there is great difference in how it is done. And uh, that can cause some tension amongst otherwise uh, godly brothers and sisters in Christ 
and it's my desire not to add to any of that tension. Some of you will know that I've grown up in the Salvation Army. The Salvation Army is a non-sacramental church. That means that in, within the Salvation Army, they don't do baptism or share the Lord's Supper. And there are historical and, I think, theological reasons for that. In the Presbyterian Church, we, because we trust in God's promise, we baptise children of believing parents. But please understand, we also baptise adults. Somewhere, someone once assumed that we don't. No, we do. We do. But that's enough of the, I'll get lost in the hows if I keep going. Well, these things are called a sacrament. The sacrament of the Lord's Supper, the sacrament of baptism. And what is a sacrament? Hold that thought for a moment. Here's from the Westminster Confession of Faith. Sacraments are sacred signs and confirmations of the covenant of grace. This covenant that God directly instituted, uh, sorry, these signs that God directly instituted to represent Christ and his benefits, to confirm our participation in him, to place a visible distinction between those who belong to the church and the rest of the world and to commit them seriously to the service of God in Christ according to his word. Augustine, a writer a long time ago, calls a sacrament a visible word, and I like that idea, this visible word. It represents the promises of God as in a picture and places it before us in a way that we can see it, a graphic form. Uh, importantly, and there's a reason I've got the Bible here, big old Bible, um, here with the bread and the cup and the, the baptism font. The two sacraments are deeply connected to the church as a community and to the Word of God. And if they are separated from either of these, it can make them an empty ritual. Any ritual, no matter how significant, can become empty. Are these sacraments essential? No. I don't believe they are essential for salvation. There's a story in the Bible where Jesus is dying between two criminals. One of them turns to him and says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And for Jesus, that was enough. Today you will be with me in paradise. Now, keep in mind that criminal died that day. He never went to church. He never shared his faith with anyone, although his testimony is shared every year. Um, he never showed hospitality. He never did the things that we expect Christian people to do. If he had been taken down from the cross and lived, would he have been baptised? Would he have shared in the Lord's Supper? Well, that's a whole different question. But are they essential for salvation? No. But I don't think they are to be ignored just because of that. So, let's go quickly. Why do we baptise people? Well, we baptise people as a sign of God's promise. God has made promises and right through the Bible, uh, from the very beginning right to the very end, we see God's promises being given and then being acted on. And through the history of the church, we see God's promise being acted on. We look at God's covenant of the past and there we see that God has redeemed his people. Even before Jesus, we see God redeeming his people in ways that point towards Jesus. Uh, and ways that kind of point towards a baptism. Noah, in his experience of the ark, and when Peter, in one of his letters, refers to Noah, he refers to Noah's experience and he connects it with a baptism. In Abraham, the father of faith, God gave to Abraham a covenant sign, which is a promise, which was then to be given to 
all the male members of their community when they were eight days old. And that's a significant aspect for us. It's also an aspect of God's covenant of the future. And so we baptise people now because of what we believe the future will hold and God's promise to the future. And so we began our service reminding ourselves of what Peter had to say that Sharif's read for us. When the people heard about Jesus, for, the, for many of them for the first time in his resurrection, and the Holy Spirit empowering Peter to speak, and people cried out, what will we do now? We are guilty of his death. Peter's comment to them was, repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. We also have baptism because it is a sign of trust in the promise. I want to be clear here, it's a sign of trust in the promise, not in the act of baptism itself. That the baptism is pointing to something. For those who are baptised as adults, the baptism is a very clear sign of turning from my old ways. And so when Peter calls people to repent and be baptised, he's talking to a group of adults and it's a sensible thing for him to say, repent and be baptised. They are turning from their old ways. For us in our time, it still happens, turning from my old ways, recognising God is infinitely holy, I am not holy, although my pride will tell me that I can work for my own salvation. But I know I'm not. And we've heard in a testimony this morning about that revelation that I'm not. I need more than I am. So I cannot stand in the presence of God, but, but God, there's that double pun, but God, but God has made his promises. In the Old Testament, God has made his promises. In Deuteronomy, he says, if you seek the Lord your God, you will find him. If you look for him with all your heart and with all your soul. Jeremiah the prophet, speaking about a time of exile, says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. To do that is to come in repentance. In repentance I come and I find forgiveness in Jesus. And baptism becomes a sign of my forgiveness and my repentance. I'm turning from my old ways and I'm turning to a new community because now I belong to Jesus and this is a sign of that belonging. Edmund Clowney, a great writer about Old Testament things, he writes about baptism as a naming ceremony and in church history there have been times when the child's name would be given during the baptism. But Clowney says that's not the point. It's not to give us the name on our birth certificate, but to give us the name that we belong to. He says this, important as the water symbol is, we must remember that we are baptised not into water, but into the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. I belong to this church. I belong to Jesus. I belong to this church. And so baptism is seen as as an initiation as a welcome into the church. Now, some of you should be joining some dots and now thinking, well, why didn't we baptise Sharif and Maddie this morning? Why didn't we have that sacrament today? And that's because baptism is something that we do once. Our salvation is not in being baptised. Our great hope, our salvation is in the promise of God ultimately expressed in Jesus Christ. So if we are baptised in line with the covenant promises of God and then walk away from God for a time 
and eventually come to our senses and return, we don't need a baptism for a second or a third time. That is done. The promises of God are sure. Now, if you'd like to explore further about what baptism means, what it means to be baptised, we can talk about that. Um, You can send me a message and I'll be happy to have that conversation. So there's baptism. Can I tell you, there have been so many books, really long books written about baptism and the Lord's Supper and I'm not even going to come close to covering most of them. So let's talk about the bread and cup. Why do we share this little meal together? Well, we share it as a sign of Christ's death. And the story that Peter read to us from the Gospel of Mark points us to that moment in history when this was being acted out. It's a sign of the body of Christ being broken. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body, take it and eat. Now the mystery or the sacrament of the Passover, which is what the disciples were celebrating at that time, is given new light here. The horror of what was about to happen is hinted at, though not understood by the disciples at that time. Take, he broke the bread, take, this is my body. But as as we, as we hold the bread in our hands, we absolutely understand it. It is Christ's body, I'm making a mess here, Christ's body broken for us. And we understand that Jesus died for us. And then we see his blood poured out. He took the cup, he gave thanks, he offered it to them, they all drank from it. And Jesus said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. We learn from the scriptures that this is a testimony of his death. As we share this bread and cup, It is a testimony of his death. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It is a sign of Christ's death. But more, well, not so much more importantly, but importantly, it is an acknowledgement of Christ's death for me. Insert your own name at that point. To take this is an acknowledgement that Christ did this for you, for me, for me, for just for me, for even me. You see, this is personal. This is something personal. So as you take it, as you hold the bread and the cup in your hand, You've got to see this as a personal thing, that Jesus died for the world, yes. For the many, yes. For me. For you. And so you hold this in your hand, a tangible reminder that this has happened. But also, this is communal. This is something that we share, as Jesus did with his disciples as has been done in the church through the ages. And this is why we, the elders, chose not to celebrate communion in whatever weird form it would be during lockdown. Because it's communal. It's a meal we share together. Now, other churches worked around that and did their own thing, and and God bless them, but we chose to wait and then wait and wait and wait until we were together again so we could share the loaf and the cup together. That's why we do these things. But why should I do these things? Is the question you need to ask yourself. Why should I do these things? Well, Paul gives explicit instructions about not sharing in this if, you're, if it's not appropriate. He says... In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, from verse 27, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner 
will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Now, we are sinners. We recognize that. We are sinners saved by grace. We know that. But what a terrible thing to be doing, to be sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup, he goes on. For those who eat and drink without discerning the, the body of Christ, I think that means the, the church, the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. This is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. And there's a much more in that chapter than about that than just what I've read here. So why would you not do this? Why would you not share the Lord's Supper or be baptised? Well, firstly, because I'm not a Christian. And if you're not a Christian, we're glad you're here. We are so pleased that you are here. We're glad that you want to learn a bit more or be exposed to something about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we want to tell you that Jesus loves you even though you are a sinner and that Jesus has paid the price, died the death to cover that cost. It is finished and in his resurrection you can find freedom. We would say to you what Peter said to those people all those years ago, repent and be baptised. So please, as we share this meal in a moment, don't take this if you're not a Christian. What do I mean by Christian? That you believe that faith in Jesus is your only, only way of salvation. Not being a good boy or good girl. Not being a member of a church, or not being a member of a church, that's not it. Not coming to church and doing this, not trusting in Jesus and anything, but just trusting Jesus as your only way of salvation. And the other reason that people might not take communion is because they're under discipline by the church elders. This doesn't happen often, but it happens. And that's why Paul writes, recognize the body. John Calvin, one of the greatest thinkers of the church, was expelled from his church in Geneva and driven out of town because he refused, he dared to believe that ministers should be able to withhold the Lord's Supper from any person holding false doctrine and any person whose life was immoral. Yet we believe that this is essential because it is folly to live in sin and to believe that that is okay to live in unrepentant sin and to believe that that is okay. So does that mean I need to be perfect before I can share this? No. Or we'd be using a much smaller loaf. No. But are you repentant? That's the big question. Repent. Believe. Repent and be baptised. Are you repentant? Two reasons that you should take this and be involved in these things. One is obedience, in line with what Jesus said, and it's recorded for us in Luke, in his telling of the story of that last supper, that he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And it is a sign of assurance. Every time we hold the cup and the bread in our hand, it should be a reminder for us, yes, an acknowledgement for us, not only of what Jesus has done for me in the past, but for what Jesus continues to do for me now. And it is then a tangible sign of assurance. I mentioned John Calvin. This is what he has, uh, something else he had to say. God appointed the sacraments in order that believers who are void and in want of all good might bring nothing of their own and simply beg. We might not like that kind of phrase, but, but keep reading. Hence, it follows that in receiving them, they do nothing which deserves praise, and that in this action, which in respect of them is merely passive, no work can be ascribed to them. We receive what God has done for us in Christ. We come now to the table. What do we bring? We bring nothing but a repentant and expectant heart. 
ready to proclaim again the Lord's death for our lives. And so we invite you to come to the table, but only if you have come first to Jesus.